In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the web administration pages of the Peplink SD switch. The Peplink SD switch configuration is typically done from in control too, but you can also connect to the management port in order to configure the device locally. Note that if you plan on configuring locally, you will need to disable the in control management. You'll find this within the web admin under the system tab and in control. Alternatively, configure this option as enable, restricted to status reporting only to be able to monitor the switch through in control, but manage it from the local web admin interface. If you adjust this, click save, then apply changes. Now let's go back to the dashboard page. At the top, we can quickly see which ports, Ethernet or SFP are connected or not. Green indicates they are connected, black means they are not. Next, we have the management interface details. This includes our management port IP address along with any VLANs that have management access. Below that is the external access, which is its access to the internet. Last on this page is the device information. This covers the model of our SD switch, its firmware and uptime, CPU load, power consumption, fan speed, and temperature, as well as the status of A and BAC power sources. Let's take a look at the configure tab. First up is the local network settings. Currently, these are configured through in control too. But if you configure locally, you simply need to create a new LAN by clicking the new LAN button. Moving to the left, we have STP or spanning tree protocol. This shows the STP bridge settings and lets you configure a different priority port if needed. As you can see, port 32768 is the default selection. Click the blue question mark to the right corner here if you need to set any additional STP settings. Next up is loop protection. Loop detection packet interval and the recovery times can be changed here. Again, we have a blue question mark icon. Clicking on it displays some details about loop protection. DHCP snooping can be enabled or disabled. When enabled, the DHCP request will be forwarded to trusted ports and only allow reply packets from trusted ports. Default mode is trusted, but you have the option of setting it to untrusted if needed. QoS or quality of service settings are also available. Classification is disabled by default, but can prioritize network traffic into eight different class of service or COS according to the tag protocol technologies being chosen. Each COS provides different levels of priority and bandwidth limit. Here's a closer look at each section. Now let's move on to the access control. This includes ingress ACL or access control list. You may add rules here as needed. We also have authentication by radius that can be enabled here. Port mirroring is another feature that can be enabled on your switch. This feature allows traffic monitoring by sending traffic to mirror ports to destination ports. Under IP multicast on the left, there is an option for IGMP snooping. This controls the delivery of IP4 multicast trafficking the IGMP snooping enabled LAN or LANs. When this is disabled, IP4 multicast traffic is always flooded. Below the enable box is the IGMP snooping table. This is on a per LAN basis, so you will add a new entry on a particular LAN. Enable querier to join IGMP querier election with the preset LAN's IP address. If no IP address is set, the default management IP is used. The switch ports page under interfaces is likely the most important to most users as it covers how each port is configured, such as the port type, trunk or access, as well as which VLAN networks they are using. You can simply click on a port or multiple ports to configure how they are set up. External access settings is set to auto by default. If you select custom instead, you can manually select which VLAN it should connect with and its connection method here. 
So you want to have a backup internet connection to your switch if the firewall it's connected to fails. This is where the USB modem can be used. If enabled, you have the option of setting manual operator settings as well as DNS servers. Last on the configure tab is the radius server. You can set up an authentication or accounting server here. Onto the system tab, this is where we will initially see details about the admin security settings. It includes web admin login settings, as well as other management settings, such as the IP address and VLANs that are allowed to access the web admin. Firmware is next. If the switch is online, you may use the check for firmware button to upgrade automatically or refer to the manual upgrade option to upload the firmware file. Time zone and time server can be set manually if needed. On the schedule page, you can create schedule profiles to apply to the ethernet ports. This allows you to disable access to a port as needed. Email notifications can be set up if you'd like to be notified of events that occur on the network, such as an internet connection failure. Under event log, you can configure a remote syslog if desired. SNMP settings are supported here. Then we have our in control page as we saw earlier. At the configuration page, you may save a copy of your current configuration settings. This is always advised before you upgrade firmware in case something fails with the firmware process. If needed, you'll also come to this page to upload the file. You may also restore factory settings at this page. Should you ever need to reboot power to the switch, you can do so from the reboot page. This allows you to reboot to a previous firmware build as well. Last on this tab are the tools including ping, traceroute, and wake on LAN. Here's a closer look at each page. Finally, we have the status tab. As it sounds, this is where we can find the status of our switch device. Its model number, serial number, and hardware revision are here, as well as its uptime. You also have diagnostic tools like the report and remote assistance. Hardware and MAC addresses are also found at this page. STP information is next. Then we have our client list, which is where we can find a list of all devices connected to our switch. If needed, you can click on different ports to only see the details about those specific connections. The event log will show events as they occur, as you can see here. This is a good place to start troubleshooting any issues that may arise. Last up is the usage reports. This is how much data has been used over the switch. You can view this as hourly, daily, or monthly usage. That's all for our overview of the SD Switch Web Admin. We hope you enjoyed this video and welcome you to subscribe to our channel for more videos like it. Thanks for watching.